Well, thank you all for waiting. We had uh, some important votes on the House floor, and we're now done voting on the House floor for the day. We've got some other meetings that are on our, our list. And I know that a couple other members are coming over uh, now that we finish voting, so we'll, uh, but we'll start in earnest. Uh, I'm Fred Upton, uh, chairman of this uh, committee, Energy and Commerce uh, Committee. And we are here today to talk about a very good news story, one that I hope is gaining the attention of the American people. Just last week, as you may know, the Wall Street Journal reported that the United States is overtaking Russia as the world's largest producer of oil and natural gas, a startling shift that is, in fact, reshaping global markets and presents now real opportunities for cooperation. The U.S. EIA Administrator Adam Siminski said it best in his reaction to the news, quote, this is a new era of thinking about market conditions and opportunities created by these conditions that you wouldn't in a million years have dreamed about. This committee has held a number of hearings on the energy transformation that is currently underway. We started off the year hearing from energy experts in the EIA to discuss not only the country's surge in production, but also the revisions upward in its estimate of the resource base, which helps us plan for future demand. We continued with hearings on the regulatory and market barriers to U.S. energy exports, as well as discussions about how our energy abundance is benefiting and will continue to benefit American manufacturing. Today, we're going to continue our exploration of this topic with this forum on the geopolitical implications and mutual benefits of U.S. LNG exports. This committee is thrilled to have before us such a wide and diverse display of international interest. I understand that we had interest from a number of other countries not represented before us today as well. So let me just say that our committee welcomes continued input from all parties interested in the issue, and we look forward to building upon our friendships and continuing that di dialogue. I also want to welcome members on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, including Congressman Turner to my right, who has been one of the earliest and most vocal champions of LNG exports here in the House. It's my hope that we can use this opportunity to better explore how moving forward with American energy exports can help strengthen our ties with foreign nations, while at the same time providing mutual benefits domestically here in the U.S. with added job creation and continued energy self-sufficiency. With that, uh, I would like to have the country participants uh, take a minute or so to introduce themselves. I'm going to turn it over to Chairman Whitfield uh, to go over the format and how we're going to divide it up. Uh, some of us have to leave again before uh, 3 o'clock. I know Thailand needs to leave at 2.45, so maybe we'll make an exception from them for them early on just to give them an extra minute or two. But let me yield to the Chairman of the Energy and Power Subcommittee, Ed Whitfield from Kentucky. <clears throat> Well, Chairman Upton, thank you very much, and uh, I certainly want to thank also the representatives of the countries represented here today uh, on, to discuss this important issue. I also want to thank uh, Mike Turner for his leadership on this issue. He's been involved very early about the importance of trying to export uh, LNG to other countries out of the U.S. Uh, today's discussion, which we, all of the members, are really looking forward to, because we want to hear from you on your perspectives of how important this issue is to your country. Uh, we think that we can benefit from it. Uh, as you know, in politics, there are always two sides, and there are groups that uh, want the U.S. to move very slowly in exporting uh, gas to other countries. Uh, but we're going to divide it up into we're going to have uh, the European area first, and I think we have three countries from uh, Europe. That's uh, Hungary, uh, Lithuania, and uh, hung, uh, Czech Republic. And then, then we'll be discussing Asia, and I think we have five countries basically from Asia, and then we'll do the Caribbean, and I think we have two countries from the Caribbean. But as Fred said, before we introduce members and so forth, uh, since the representative from Thailand does have to leave in just a few minutes uh, because of our delay, we would like to give you an opportunity to make your presentations on the importance of this issue as it relates to Thailand. So if, if you would uh, introduce yourself and make your comments, we really would look forward to hearing what you have to say. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Afton and Mr. Whitfields and members of the Congress. Also, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Saro Tanasanti. I'm a Chartier's Affairs of Royal Thai Embassy. I would like to uh, express our sincere appreciation that the, the House has uh, organized this forum, which is the, uh, one of the uh, issues that Thailand also a task very important on that. Uh, if I may, to just just to summarize some points, you know, just to save time of the forum on that, you know, I would like to go on the uh, uh, energy outlooks of Thailand, and then the uh, uh, and, and some points that I would like to to highlight on that. You know, uh, uh, Thailand, we are a net energy importer and the second largest oil importers in South Asia. Uh, we are clearly import over half of energy that we consume particularly uh, natural gas, which is account for the largest proportion of our energy consumption, around 46%, or 37% coal and ignites about 15%. Uh, the Thailand demands for energies uh, will double within the next 25 years if the consumption continues to grow as a current rate, which is around 2.6% annually. This is the, uh, uh, we will likely to remain the net energy importer. In the overall picture of our energy policy, uh, our government also attached very important in development on re renewable and alternative energy, which is the, we set the goal that the, by the year 2021, uh, in the, uh, the proportion of renewable and alternative energy Will be, uh, will be used at least 25%. For the uh, natural gas, the natural gas remain one of the important energy sources to our energy sec security compared to other sources of energy uh, because it's cheaper and cleaner than oil. Currently, Thailand domestic natural gas production meet around 75% of our domestic demand which is the, uh, uh, mostly the uh, uh, PTT, which is the natural oil company we import from Indonesia, Nigeria, Peru, Qatar, Yemen, and Russia. This is the, uh, uh, since the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, we really looking forward to the energy, energy supply, which is more stable and reliable source. Uh, looking ahead, we foresee some challenges in the future that, the, uh, that uh, particularly the, the biggest one is that how to meet the growing demand in the years to come as gas reserves in the Gulf of Thailand are depleting and the, pot and the production is falling. So we projected that you know, by the year 2030, 40% of the gas supply will be LNG import. This is some protection from our country and then the, we need to find the new supply source with the security of supply. Uh, at this moment, PPT, PTT, which is our national oil, import, uh, national oil company, we has concluded a long-term contract with, to import LNG from Qatar at around 2 million tons per year during from, from 2015 to 2035. And uh, uh, the PTT also uh, uh, investing a lot to expand the LNG regasification terminal, which is the uh, uh, suggest in the Thailand Eastern Seaboard, that uh, we will increase the annual capacity around 5 million tons of LNG to 10 million tons. This is projection for the next four years. Uh, buying LNG through spot and contract or long-term contracts uh, such, uh, such as Qatar, Austria, Indonesia. PTT is also looking for opportunities to acquire LNG at cheaper price by investing in LNG production projects, such as a floating liquefied natural gas in Australia, shale gas in Canada, where the company already has existing investment. The discovery of shale gas in the United States is certainly of interest of Thailand, it's opened new prospect of ample, reliable supplies of LNG at a reasonable, stable price. PTT International, which is the subsidiary of PTT, 
is seriously considering the possibility for importing LNG from United States. Uh, however, to import LNG from the U.S. requires a huge amount of investment, and also that uh, big investment also needs some certain levels of certainty and predictability that LNG from this venture will be allowed to be exported. Uh, while Thailand is a U.S. ally, we are categorized as a non-FTA country under the existing National Gas Act. We do not benefit from the expedite approval process. The length of the LNG export approval process and uncertainties associated with it weigh heavily in our consideration. I should note that the PTT exploration and production is also interesting in exploring shale gas in the United States. Opportunity for LNG export will therefore broaden opportunity for our partnership. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for uh, that uh, comment. We appreciate it. And uh, at this time, what I would like to do is I would like to just go around the table and let every member give their name and the state that they're from. And then we're going to give uh, each one of you an opportunity to simply give your name, the country, uh, your position. And then uh, we will start the discussion first with uh, the European area. So, Morgan, why don't we start with you? Lee Terry, I represent uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Hi, Bob Latta from Northwest West Central Ohio. And uh, of course, Ohio, we have the Utica Shale. I'm Mike Turner from Ohio. I want to thank uh, Chairman Whitfield and Chairman Upton for having this important uh, issue uh, be, um, for us to focus on uh, ways in which we can find a solution. So thank you. And of course, Chairman Upton is from Michigan. I'm from Kentucky. And Mr. Barton. Barton from Texas. I have met with the ambassador from Hungary and my friends in the Czech Republic. Um, the chairman emeritus in uh, Texas is, is a leader in energy of all sorts. Yeah, my name is Jerry McNerney. I'm from California. And I see a tremendous opportunity here for us to, uh, to move into with some uh, regard for uh, the environment and for the economic stabilization that this represents. Hi, I'm Mike Pompeo. I represent South Central Kansas. Steve Scalise, represent Louisiana's first district and home to the Chenier LNG export facility that we're very proud of. Pete Olson, Texas 22, the energy capital of the world. Welcome. <laughs> uh, Congressman Bill Johnson from uh, Ohio 6th Congressional District, and he's wrong. Um, uh, I, I sit on top of the uh, Marcellus and the Utica Shale. Uh, in my district, and I'm also one of the co-founders of the uh, LN, uh, Liquid Natural Gas Export Working Group here within the House, the bipartisan group. Okay, thank you, members, for doing that. Now, at this time, Mr. Zajacek, we can begin with you, and if you just introduce yourself, your position, and the country, and we'll go down the line. Good afternoon. My name is Jaroslav Zajacek. I'm Deputy Chief of Mission of the Czech Republic. Thank you. I'm René Jean Jumeau. I am the Minister Delegate for Energy Security in the Republic of Haiti. Hi, my name is Anita Orban. I am the Special Envoy of Energy Security of Hungary. Taranjit Sandhu, Deputy Chief of Mission of India. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yasushi Akoshi, Economic Minister at Embassy of Japan. My name is Jekyman Taspoilonius. I'm Ambassador to the U.S. and Mexico, also representing First Baltic EU Presidency. My name is Efraín O'Neill. I am Senior Energy Advisor to the Governor of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ashok Mirpuri, the Ambassador of the Republic of Singapore. My name is Ho Yong An. I'm Ambassador of South Korea. Glad to see all of you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the gentleman from Thailand, I know you're getting ready to leave, but thank you for joining us this uh, afternoon. Now, before we get into the discussion, I just want to make 
a brief comment. Uh, like, as I said, we'll take up the European countries first, and uh, we would look forward to hearing from the three of you from Europe. And if members would not object, uh, what I'd like to do is to let every one of them complete their uh, brief statement. And then if we have any questions, then we can ask those questions. And then after that, we'll go to Asia. And then after that, we'll go to the Caribbean. So b before we start, I, I would, might just say that current export approvals, four projects have been approved to non-free trade agreement countries uh, so far. There are 21 applications currently pending at the Department of Energy for export to non-free trade agreement countries. And there are six pending applications to export to free trade agreement countries. And as I said, uh, we're very uh, thrilled in America that we have this additional natural gas now and, and to have the opportunity to listen to you and to, from your perspective of what it can mean, uh, we really look forward to your testimony. So. Uh, Mr. Sajacek, we'll begin with you, and if you'll make a brief statement, and then we'll go to Ambassador Orban and down. Thank you, and good afternoon again. Uh, the Czech Republic is a very strong advocate of uh, U.S. LNG exports, and in my opening remarks, I would like to build that around you know three big issues. I'll start with the issue of energy security. Uh, for the past 20 years, we have uh, been working very hard uh, to diversify our energy s resources, energy uh, supplies, and transport routes. And I think we've been quite successful, although 75% uh, still uh, depends on, on Russian uh, gas. Now, uh, when inviting uh, the U.S. to export LNG, I think uh, it would um, help us uh, in the negotiations with our suppliers. Uh, the negotiations can be very tough, as you well know. There are some long-term contracts, and simply by the fact of, of putting the uh, LNG from U.S. on the European market, it will help us to have a bigger stick in our hand in these negotiations. Uh, also, this helps to change a little bit the logic of thinking in Central Europe. Always it has been East-West thinking. Now, uh, with uh, LNG uh, possibilities in, in, in the terminals, um, the north-south interconnector is something that we are extremely interested in. So, so if we manage to finalize the project connecting Poland through Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Hungary and Croatia, we'll be able to change the whole uh, logic and we need gas for that. So there is this uh, strong, strong uh, invitation uh, that should also help us in uh, moving forward uh, the uh, interconnector uh, building. Uh, second point uh, is uh, free trade. The Czech Republic has always been a staunch supporter and strong believer in uh, free trade. When the Czechs presided over the EU in 2009, our logo was Europe without barriers, both on internal market and free trade. Uh, I have to applaud uh, here the initiative uh, by Congressman Turner uh, here, sincerely, because this initiative uh, to uh, provide uh, allies with LNG uh, coming from the U.S. is something that is of crucial importance for us. Uh, it's a symbol of uh, our cooperation, strategic cooperation between the Europeans and, and the Americans, but it also puts us in, in a different league. We are in League B. Uh, we would like to be in, in League A, I'll be very honest, and I think uh, we deserve, uh, deserve that. So uh, applause to uh, your initiative, Mr. Mr. Turner. Uh, last but not least, uh, this is uh, an opportunity for U.S. businesses, uh, quite a significant one. Um, now, we should get better on creating even more jobs in the in the US by allowing uh, LNG uh, market uh, to be exported. Uh, it's a win-win situation. Uh, we get uh, you know more and relatively cheaper uh, gas. You'll get uh, more opportunities uh, to export. Very easy to look at the, at the map of the prices. Uh, the um, LNG price right now of the per, per million BTUs is around three dollars, three twenty. The price in Europe, um, in UK, Belgium, or or Spain is around 10. Now, even if you take into account uh, the current technology of uh, liquefaction, transport, and regasification, uh, it aims to some you know, five dollars, let's say five or six dollars. This makes it very com competitive, even on the uh, European territory. So, big export opportunity for U.S. companies. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and Ambassador Orban, uh, you'll make your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman distinguished members of Congress, ladies and gentlemen. 
Let me thank you for this opportunity to organize this forum on such an important topic for uh, my country, Hungary, as well. I am representing a country, a NATO ally, a US ally, which is very much dependent on imported energy. We are importing over 65% of our energy need. We are importing over 80% of our oil uh, consumption, and we are importing over 75% of our natural gas consumption. So energy security and import dependence is uh, one of the key considerations of the Hungarian uh, government. The shale gas revolution gave the US a unique opportunity to turn from an energy scarce country to an energy abundant country. But we believe that this opportunity should be grasped not only domestically, but globally as well. The discussion should be shifted not only about the price of gas, how it would change domestically in the US market, but what role the United States could play in the global LNG market. We are expediting LNG for US allies. The United States has the chance to meet all the major energy policy considerations of the allies. That's the economic aspect of the energy policy, the environmental aspect of the energy policy, and the security aspect of the energy policy. As my Czech colleague uh, mentioned, the very fact that American LNG could appear on the Central European and the European market would give us a negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis our traditional supplier, which would result immediately in lower prices. If the US LNG expedited to the Allies, that would help the Allies to replace uh, fossil fuels, which are more polluting with natural gas in their energy mix. That would meet that would help all of us to meet the global climate objectives. And thirdly, expedited US LNG would assist the very consideration security issue of the Allies, and that's energy security and import dependence. We believe that we are this energy abundance, the United States can enhance its own foreign policy objectives via a new tool, which is called energy diplomacy. As a result, we would encourage our American friends to incorporate the geopolitical dimension, the foreign policy dimension, into the discussion about the impact of US LNG also domestically. And we believe that the discussion needs to be elevated to a strategic level. The question which needs to be asked is what role the United States would like to play in the global LNG market? what role the U.S. is about to play to meet the climate objective, and what role the United States wants to play vis-à-vis -vis key NATO and U.S. allies. And we believe that this LNG export opportunity can single-handedly meet all these objectives. I would like to call your attention also here to a time gap issue. We believe that the momentum is here now but it may elapse in a couple of years' time because new suppliers may appear in the market because of the internal dynamics in Central Europe, because of the urgency to act uh, regarding the climate. So the momentum is here now and it should be grasped. So at this point, I would like to thank for the leadership of Congressman Turner, for the leadership of Chairman Upton and Chairman Whitfield for raising this topic and understanding the urgency to act and the opportunity which is out there. And we would encourage our American friends to grab this momentum and assist the allies via this new tool, which is uh, the energy diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the gentleman from Lithuania. Thank you so much. Well, I represent the country that was the first revolt in, inside the Soviet Union, and now we preside over European Union success of American non-recognition policy, and thank you for this, uh, gentlemen. Well, uh, from the very beginning, we've been very hard working with energy security. Uh, uh, we've been, uh, together with Poland, uh, the country that introduced uh, energy security into the founding treaties of uh, European Union, and now we have this common energy policy like it is. We've been working hard inside NATO on energy security, and we have some energy security center in, in my country. And I still remember first energy summits uh, with Vice President Cheney visiting Vilnius, and he made a very nice speech there. And it was so impressive that uh, the oil supplies from Russia was cut uh, and uh, some kind of pipeline we have, and it was uh, so damaged that it's under uh, kind of uh, reconstruction and renovations for the last seven years. It had to be serious damage, we think. Uh, well, uh, but thanks God we, have, uh, we had an alternative uh, oil uh, terminal built on the sea, and we are surviving. The same happened with gas in our region. 
uh, some time ago in the beginning of our independence we've been quite naive and we sold the gas distribution network in all three Baltic states to Russian Gazprom. Today we are 100 percent dependent on the Russian Gazprom. Then the Russians promised to, uh, to us the uh, uh, the best price in the world. Well, actually, yes, that's the best, but that's the highest price in the world that we pay today together with uh, our dear friends, Ukrainians. And we think that this is a political price. Uh, we support Ukrainians on, on the endeavor to, to go to, to closer to European Union, but we also the country that support very much the liberalization uh, of, of gas market uh, and so-called unbundling di directive uh, directed against the third country uh, uh, dominated monopolies uh, uh, in, in, inside EU and some important co uh, it's uh, one important co case in European Court of Justice that is being launched against Gazprom. All of that uh, brings us to pay the highest price for the gas in the world. So what do we do? We build this wonderful vessel, actually, thanks to Ambassador from South Korea. It's built in South Korea, and you should see that YouTube. It's, you know, you just write Independence Lithuania because the, sh the vessel's name is Independence. So it is important for us to consolidate our independence with this vessel, and this import terminal will be operating from next year in my country. We need your gas, gentlemen, to consolidate our independence, to continue with the dream of Europe whole and free in a way you uh, made us happy in Lithuania, and that's possible. We wanna buy your gas, and you know, you can do it this time in, in real terms. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Uh, if any of you, yes, Mike, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, Chairman Upton, Chairman Whitfield, thank you for your leadership on this issue and for holding this event and for all of our foreign dignitaries uh, to participate. Uh, this is uh, one of those strange issues in export where we find ourselves being our own impediment. Uh, usually when there is an export-import issue, uh, you're turning to the country that you want to export to, asking them to lower their barriers. This is one where we're having to look inward to ourselves to, to lower our own barrier. Uh, I appreciate your, your interest. Not only uh, are each of you incredible allies, but you're also uh, very dedicated and important potential customers. <clears throat> and uh, I appreciate that you in indicated the issue of both jobs and economics. Uh, we know that our economies are very linked. When we strengthen your economy, we're also strengthening ours. So the issue of energy uh, is not just a, a national security, but it's an economic security issue that we, sh we share in between us. I appreciate the reference to my bill, the Expedited LNG for American Allies Act, which would um, lower those barriers for our NATO allies and, and Japan, but also includes for other allies, for example, India, uh, a provision where our Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense could determine that it would be in our national security security interest for them to share in the same designation, and we would bypass our Department of Energy uh, restrictions. Um, and we had um, Amos uh, Hochstein in front of the U.S., um, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Diplomacy in front of the U.S. delegation of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly this morning, and he was detailing some of the issues that Europe is facing. And he also noted um, that the fact that the United States is no longer a significant importer and is not Im importing has had already an effect on international markets because of the increased availability of LNG that's not destined uh, to our ports. Even if we lower our barriers tomorrow, there are significant logistical issues uh, before the first um, ship shows up and, and departs. And I was wondering, um, <clears throat> Ambassadors Icek and uh, Orban and uh, Pavlonius, uh, Pavlonius, if you would um, speak of the issue of, although there would be a lag, the moment that the United States enters into, uh, the, declares itself uh, into the market, uh, that uh, what effects it might be able to have uh, in Europe and with our allies. Okay, uh, I, will, I will start. Um, um, well. The mere, the mere fact of uh, U.S. Uh, export uh, to uh, to Europe, as I said, is uh, leading to enhancing uh, our 
our security. So that's uh, that's uh, the most important uh, thing uh, that uh, I mentioned. What concrete implications it may have? It will uh, depend from a landlocked country like the Czech Republic is how uh, well we are doing in terms of uh, you know building all the relevant interconnectors. Uh, we have learned our lessons in 2009 uh, when the uh, Russia uh, Ukraine gas dispute actually uh, enabled for complete. Uh, stoppage of uh, gas flow into uh, into large part of of Europe, and uh, we have uh, learned that actually uh, this crisis can uh, lead to something uh, positive. Europe finally realized how vulnerable it is. We have managed to redirect some of the flows to help some uh, other countries. We have uh, allocated funds for uh, underground storages, uh, for building new uh, terminals, for uh, allowing to for reverse flows uh, to be to be built. So uh, this is a very direct uh, implication that um, we can we can feel on our everyday basis uh, by you know introducing uh, this this gas uh, to the market that will be uh, available, we can uh, be a much stronger uh, player if we do our uh, homework and we are on our best way to uh, accomplish uh, this. Ambassador. Yeah. Thank you. When we are talking about the European energy market, it is important to understand that there is no integrated energy market in Europe at the moment. The weight is in the United States. The market is not as liquid and not interconnected. And there are two parts of Europe, the Western European part, which is in between the Atlantic Ocean and about Germany and Austria, is, is more or less already integrated and starts to resemble the way the United States uh, energy market works. But markets are east from this region, so east from Germany and Austria, all of us here representing those countries, Central Eastern Europe, are still in uh, living in a region where the markets are not interconnected, the markets are absolutely fragmented, and monopoly pricing and behavior exist in our countries. So if the US LNG exp would be expedited and would appear on the market quicker, or, and we understand these logistical barriers, but we would have a clear timetable to see how much quantity is coming to the market. That would have a multiple impact in our countries. First of all, in Western Europe, there are numerous unused or underutilized regasification terminals already in place. If the new uh, of US LNG would come on board, that would have a, a few pending terminals in Central Eastern Europe to make the final investment decisions and to come on board. Just to name one, in Croatia, we have a pending terminal uh, construction. As soon as we could commit to long-term LNG, US LNG supply, that would make the terminal immediately uh, up uh, for construction. Many countries' long-term agreement with Russia expires in the next couple of years to come. And of course, the negotiating position of every single country depends on how many alternatives that country has. A clear commitment of US LNG would be incorporated into that negotiation, resulting in uh, lower prices. As you know, there are huge disparities between the American and the European uh, uh, prices, and also within Europe, Central Eastern Europe is uh, suffering a 25-30% higher price than Western Europe does. And I would like to point out one more important uh, thing, which is not uh, that much noticed uh, yet. The countries of the energy community, like countries of the Western Balkans, and Ukraine and Moldova are on the way of integrating into the EU energy market. So the US LNG could even reach these countries via the existing already reverse flows towards Ukraine, for example. So via US LNG, it could have an impact not only in uh, 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 EU countries, but also further down the road in Ukraine, Moldova, as well as the Western Balkans. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, in our case, uh, the timetable is quite clear. We have our LNG import terminal operational from next year. By the way, yes, it's disconnected from other EU countries, but three Baltic states who are now under domination of, of monopoly, gas from monopoly, they are connected. So uh, we have a possibility to use the gas for all three Baltic uh, countries, especially when, you know, winters are so, so cold in, in our case. And, uh, well, maybe a bit more ironically, uh, we uh, kind of really want to see uh, Russian and, and American gas to compete in a 
ma our market. We really believe in market principles and transparency. And you know, it's it's one thing when we say a lot about resets and then kind of theories, and another thing is when you compete in a market condition. So it's exactly the market we want to create and test that friendship on the ground. Yeah. Joe, do you have anything? Thank you, Mark. Did you have anything you want to say to him? On, on this part? Yeah. I'll ask, I'll ask one question to our Europeans. Um, what is the, the Russian position on um, you contacting uh, the United States suppliers for potential imports? Are they, I don't I know, are they, are, are they friendly towards that or do they try to pressure you th both economically and uh, diplomatically against it? Um, personally, I have not come across uh, any direct uh, pressure, by, but by definition, uh, Russia now uh, has got more pipelines than its own resources, so they can you know, play uh, with where they would send the gas. That's a very important fact to, to uh, remember. But uh, we've got a long-term contract. Uh, this is not uh, an issue. What I think is worrying uh, for Russia being the, the supplier is the whole emergence of, of uh, uh, LNG shell gas uh, in, in the world context because that puts a competitive pressure uh, on them. So, of course, when we are turning to the U.S. in allowing for the LNG to be put on the European market, that is also a threat to a certain extent uh, to the Russian export of gas. That's uh, by definition. Uh, so I'm very sure that uh, the Russians are not particularly happy uh, about it and are watching it very closely, what, what has been uh, happening uh, in the global context. This is one of the sticks, if I may use the terminology again, of the US that uh, you have got in your hands in order to be able uh, to talk even more uh, in, from geopolitical energy perspective. Thank you. Do you have a comment? I can just echo my Lithuanian colleagues saying that it has been a long-standing aspiration of every Hungarian government for the last couple of years, independent of color, to enhance the energy security of the country and to create gas-to-gas -gas competition. Gas-to-gas -gas competition meaning pipeline gas with LNG gas and gas from different sources. Uh, we would like to have a lower gas price to be more competitive. In Hungary, the gas share of gas in our energy mix is, uh, is very high, it's 44%. Uh, it is used for electricity generation, it is used for, for heating, 75% of the households are using gas for heating and used by the industry. To be competitive, to have affordable energy prices for the customers, we need gas-to-gas -gas competition. Thank you. Yes, completely in agreement with previous colleagues. You know, we believe in freedom, we believe in competition, we believe in market. That's what we learned actually also in this great capital. So, uh, and that's why we want to introduce it to energy markets. That's simply kind of natural. And those countries who are afraid of competition, who likes to keep monopolies uh, and distort the market, well, they are showing their own weakness. Uh, but it's, I don't think that this is uh, something we have to defend. Mm -hmm. uh, we defend market and, and, and competition and freedom. And the uh, terminal in Lithuania that you intend to open next year is, is that a floating terminal, is that correct? Yes, and that should satisfy 25% of our demand. Yeah. So and, have, and is that yes, uh, government money or private money or a combination of both? It's a combination of both. It's, it's state is involved. Uh, uh, but as I said, this is very important for Baltic, uh, for Baltic market in general, that we try to interconnect. You know, we are building those interconnections. We're trying to build with Poland, uh, uh, in electricity, with Nordic market, with Central. So uh, integration in the energy market is our goal as well. It, but it takes time, yeah. and we don't have time sometimes, especially when you pay those huge bills for energy, and our salaries, believe me, are really lower than yours. I know that uh, in Hungary you, you had indicated that in Croatia you're building this terminal and Qatar is involved in that as well, is that correct? Is it a partnership with Qatar or are they involved in that? Uh, we are the, at the moment we are trying to put together a regional coalition because that, what my colleagues also mentioned that the problem with the fragmented markets that one market in itself is very small. 
Right. You know, for an LNG terminal to be sustainable, you need a regional market behind it. Right. And that's why we are talking so much about this interconnectivity and integration of our markets, because that's what we need to do at this moment, yeah. to interconnect our markets, to create the economy of scale and to demand side behind an LNG terminal. Well, is the European Union involved in this interconnection yeah. project? or So there's private money, EU money, individual country money as well? Yes, when I refer to the crisis that happened to, uh, on the gas dispute between Ukrainians and, and Russians, as a result of that, still during uh, the first half of 2009, we agreed at the European level to uh, dedicate you know, large sums of, of money that were destined specifically for these purposes. Uh, so there are you know, all these projects we are talking about, Baltic interconnection, North-South interconnection, it's all part of you know, European focus where concrete money is being uh, allocated. But of course, it just complements uh, the efforts that are being done on national level. Uh, does anyone else have any? Yeah, Bob. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And if I could maybe just ask the same questions uh, to each of the ambassadors. How long uh, does it take to negotiate a contract with the Russians, and how long do those contracts last? Uh, luckily enough, I was not present at the negotiations, but um, we've got a long-term contract. I'm, I hope I'm not revealing any, any uh, commercial uh, secrets here, but uh, ours uh, goes for the time being till uh, 2035. These long-term contracts are for 20, 25 years because of the nature, how, how, uh, because it's pipeline gas, and that's uh, uh, how uh, it, the market is set up. Uh, so it's a 20, 25 years long, and of course, renegotiation takes years. Thank you. Well, the same in Lithuanian case, but uh, our experience that the more we negotiate, uh, the price is rising all the time, so we don't see any kind of green light uh, at the end of the tunnel. That's why we are sitting here and asking uh, kind of to continue with those first steps in, in liberalizing the trade in, of LNGs. So, so what would you, uh, let me just ask one question and I'll go to you, Pete. If you're unsuccessful in bringing in large amounts of natural gas, uh, Europe has moved very quickly into renewable energy and uh, these natural gas prices are also very high, particularly from Russia. If you're unsuccessful in doing this, it's got to be pretty dramatic negative impact on your economies, I would assume. Correct? Yeah. You know, our energy mixes uh, are diverse. They are really based on you know country-specific situation. On electricity production, we still have got two-thirds uh, production uh, of, of coming from coal and one-third from nuclear. So, from the you know domestic energy security viewpoint, uh, coal and nuclear are really the resources where you don't need to worry that much uh, about uh, you know external dependence. So that's why our mix uh, has to be balanced not only in terms of you know. Uh, efficiency uh, but and and costs but also from this geopolitical uh, geopolitical game uh, as a follow-up to the last question if I if I still may about the, the the contracts of course we all have got contracts the problem is that the pipes uh, go through countries uh, where also from time to time there are disputes between the resource and the transit country so you know we have uh, become a hostage to certain extent to disputes between the supplier and a transit country and uh, uh, let's see whether this was the last uh, dispute. We have uh, heard, you know, some uh, some comments uh, that are somehow uh, related also to the forthcoming uh, Vilnius uh, summit on Eastern Partnership that they might be consequences uh, and that some winters can be really cold. So this is the problem that that we have. We can have contracts, but very often we are dependent on uh, the transit uh, routes, and if the sources dries out, then uh, we are completely dependent. Okay, we'll go to Pete and then. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to talk about the NATO alliance. Yeah. And all three of your countries are NATO allies. And on behalf of the people of Texas 22 and Americans, I want to thank you. Because I know all three of your countries have had your citizens, your brave citizens, killed in Afghanistan. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of the alliance and stepping up. We got attacked on 9-11. Um, how does U.S. LNG exports strengthen NATO? Kind of simple question, I think, but I, I would assume it really makes it makes the strategic alliance more stronger. 
more stronger, not more stronger, stronger. And I'd just like to elaborate uh, from the Czech Republic's position, how does, how does NATO get strengthened by our LNG exports? Well, I would refer uh, to my um, opening remark uh, when I spoke about the energy security as, as number one, when I even speak of the LNG export. So when I speak of energy security, it's part of security in, in general terms. You know, uh, the Czechs have always tried to uh, avoid being a black passenger of, of security. That's why we are in Afghanistan. That's uh, why we are the protecting power of U.S. interest in Syria. That's why uh, we are collaborating on the chemical and biological, uh, uh, you know, cooperation with the, with the U.S., uh, Having said that, we are seeking something that I would call strategic uh, security reassurance coming from the, from, uh, the U.S. Because it's, it's still, you know, if you just look uh, on the map, it, it will give you a, a hint. You know, we still are seeking uh, for, for this so-called reassurance. And this would be part of it. This would be part of the reassurance that the transatlantic bond is still alive and kicking when we try to do our best while providing security in the neighborhood together with the U.S., then we would definitely appreciate this coming from uh, the U.S. side as well. Thank you, sir. Ambassador Orban, from Hungary's perspective, how does LNG, US LNG strengthen the NATO alliance? As Chairman also pointed out, the key word uh, nowadays in Europe is competitiveness, how Europe can enhance its competitiveness and how especially our economies can enhance our competitiveness. And of course, if uh, we can create gas-to-gas -gas competition, which I would uh, assume that would result at least 20-30% uh, decrease of our natural gas price immediately, that would enhance and robust our economies, in which in turn we could uh, add even more to our joint uh, uh, NATO endeavors all over the world. And as I, my Czech colleague pointed out, and as uh, uh, you highlighted, thank you very much, we are in with the United States in numerous global operations, uh, which are, which are an F joint efforts to meet global challenges. In some of them, it is more of a security issue for the United States than for us. We are in together, but for us, the key security issue is the energy security issue. And we see in this LNG export a unique opportunity to handle it really easily after so many long uh, years that we try to tackle this issue actually together. Thank you. Ambassador have Lithuania's position, sir. NATO strengthened by LNG yeah. exports from the United States. Thank you. Well, Congressman, you are very right. You know, we stand for each other on military fronts. Lithuania was the smallest country to run its own PRT in Afghanistan. We have our special forces still fighting with you, and they will continue fighting with you in South Afghanistan. But, you know, we have to, f to fight for each other in, those, uh, in the areas of new challenges, be it cyber, be it uh, energy security. If, uh, you know, we have um, cuts of supplies, if, if uh, our security is in threat, we have to stand for each other. So LNG is something that uh, would really uh, benefit to the common security of the whole transatlantic family. And this is, uh, this is, this is also just a market. Uh, you know, it's win-win it's, it's for your business, but it's also win-win for, for, you know, political stability. Thank you, sir. Yield back. Lee. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, this uh, committee has jurisdiction over trade, non-tariff related trade, which means regulatory. Most of the European Union discussions are going to be uh, regarding uh, breaking down barriers. Mr. Turner mentioned that part of our issue in being able to export to you are our internal barriers and regulations. Therefore, uh, can you quickly and simply explain, because I don't want to take all day here, uh, what efforts are being taken by your individual country w in regard to encouraging Brussels to focus on breaking down our barriers uh, to export within the European uh, trade agreement? We'll just go in the same order as we always go. Okay, it's it's, it's a logically uh, challenging concept uh, when uh, we have to convince the EU that you should uh, break your I know, it internal, sounds strange your, to us, too. Uh, that, that's why we're here today uh, as well, but I'm pretty convinced that this is our position uh, in the preparatory uh, or actually ongoing talks on the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. We very much hope energy chapter uh, will play a prominent role. Uh, uh, but 
you know negotiations will will take uh, take time that's why i think uh, initiatives like uh, mike turner's is is crucial because i we never know how long the negotiations will will take uh, on both sides we've got uh, some uh, constraints um we'll have uh, european uh, elections uh, next uh, next year uh so with the ratification process i can see at the earliest uh, the date for the ttip to enter into force 2018 if everything goes well but on these uh, lng exports we can get something uh, earlier we d and we don't have to uh, stand in the line so uh, in the eu is a very complicated body you know it's you know 28 member states commission negotiating on behalf of the member states i can only tell you that our well, delegation will be very strongly advocating uh, this you know market access uh, on, on on your side or uh, getting uh, rid of uh, the export barriers on on your side as our negotiating you know bid but i can assure you that but they are 28 uh, 27 other member states yes ambassador Thank you. Uh, this is uh, uh, while the member state we are supporting this process. This is an EU uh, overall competence. So the EU is negotiating on behalf of the member states. In the background, we are supporting the EU to, to speed up the negotiations and to also include LNG free trade in these negotiations. What we are concentrating our efforts on as Hungary, during our Hungarian uh, uh, chairmanship of the European Union in 2011, it was, hung, uh, it was during that time in 2011 that the heads of state and government committed to create an internal energy market by 2014 in the European Union. Now, as the chairmen of the Visegrad Cooperation, which is four countries in Central Europe, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and Czech Republic, one of our major goals is to overcome the non-infrastructure barriers in front of trade within the EU. So we, uh, we are continuing uh, uh, and working along the roadmap accepted during the Polish presidency, which means creating energy corridors from Central Europe to all the big energy hubs in Western Europe as well as in Southeastern Europe, overcome all those non-infrastructure barriers, regulatory barriers, legal barriers, which are in front of trade, that we can really reach this objective of having an internal energy market by the time we have the big negotiations finished. Mm. Thank you. Well, from my side, I can say uh, that while well, we believe in TTIP negotiations, you know, if we want to preserve our way of life and be competitive as transatlantic family, we have to do it. And as we see it, uh, it's about, well, 10, 20 percent of tariff barriers, and but 80 percent of, of non-tariff regulatory uh, barriers that we will have to discuss with you. Uh, so that's why we appreciate uh, those negotiations and, and we hope uh, uh, that the second round of those negotiations will take as soon as possible. Uh, it's, it's a pity that, uh, well, you have something to do here in Congress and uh, that doesn't allow you uh, maybe to, uh, to have those negotiations. We really encourage uh, uh, those disagreements to, to be settled as soon as possible, of course. But, uh, you know, in any case, it will take some time, you know, a year or two for negotiations. That's why we welcome the initiatives of Congressman Turner to, to do it, you know, right now. Unilaterally, you can do it, uh, you know, and we are waiting. You have a demand, as you see around the table. So don't wait for those negotiations to finish because it will take time. It's a welcome process. It's wonderful. It's most historic process because it will create the best trading block in the world, I would say. But, you know, we, we have to do it now. Clock is ticking. Well, thank you all for your questions and thank uh, you three very much for giving us your perspective. Uh, even though we're going to leave Europe right now, we know we're going to continue to work closely with you on this issue of energy independence and uh, the use of natural gas. So, now we'll move into Asia, and Mr. Sandhu, I know that India is the fourth largest consumer of energy in the world, and if you would give us uh, your perspective, we'd appreciate that. Chairman Whitfield, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me this afternoon, along with many distinguished colleagues from the Diplomatic Corps to participate in this forum on an issue of tremendous strategic significance and future global economic growth and progress. I bring to you the greetings and warm wishes from a friend of the United States and a country of one billion people. The relationship between the United States and India is multidimensional, vibrant, and growing. The subject of energy and energy to secure and use it in the most efficient and clean way is critical for India. 
Over the past decade, the United States has made exciting progress in safe, efficient, and cost-effective harnessing of shale gas and energy. It has emerged as the one of the world's most important gas-producing countries. This is good news for India. Despite the global economic slowdown, India's economy has grown at a relatively brisk pace over the last seven years, and it will continue to do so in the future. India is now believed to be the world's fifth largest energy consumer. It imports 75% of its energy, especially oil and petroleum products, which may reach 90% over the next decade. India is working hard to diversify its energy resources. Energy and LNG are important for socio-economic development and inclusive growth of millions of our people. A boost in LNG exports in the US would have many positive effects on both United States and Indian economies. For the US, it would help create thousands of jobs and an expanded revenue stream for the US government. For India, it would provide a steady, reliable supply of clean energy and help diversify our imports from our traditional suppliers. The prospects of increased Indian investments in the US natural gas market will further push a strong and mutually rewarding energy partnership, as well as further consolidate our strategic ties and deeper cooperation for the benefit of millions of people in both countries. We look forward to working closely with the US administration and the US Congress on LNG exports. We commend your leadership and seek your support on this win-win issue for both United States and India. Thank you. You know, I was so mesmerized by the European discussion that I was supposed to introduce Joe Barton to head up the discussion on Asia. So Mr. Barton will be moderating Asia. You do it so well, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Asian issue is, is something somewhat different than the European. In, in Europe, we've got uh, a dominance uh, between the European Union and Russia. When you look at Asia, you have three of the five world's largest economies in China, India, and Japan, uh, plus South Korea, which I believe is in the top ten. And the focus in terms of supply shifts from, from Russia to Australia, uh, the Indian Ocean, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, so it is a little bit of a different discussion. And we've already heard from India. We'd now like to hear from Japan, who has, uh, uh, in the process of uh, uh, shutting down their nuclear capacity, uh, indicated that they uh, uh, desperately need uh, more LNG uh, imports, and they're hopeful that they may come from the United States. So Mr. Ambassador from Japan. Thank you very much. I'd like to present uh, our observation on today's theme. Uh, let me begin with an overview of the world's LNG supply and three significant changes that are occurring. To begin with, uh, the U.S. is now seeking to establish a new, LNG, new flow of LNG to Asia. Next, the new pricing formula, not based on the crude oil price ring, has appeared. So the pricing mechanism would be diversified. Lastly, additional LNG projects will start up throughout the world in the near future. And there will be competition related to att attractive price and trading conditions. Among them, the US LNG exports are significant game changers, not only, Japan, not only for Japan, but for many other countries. Now let's turn to several challenges from Japan energy outlook. <coughs> the loss of nuclear power due to the Fukushima accident in 2011 uh, brought about a severe impact on Japan's economy through tremendous, tremendous amount of additional purchasing of fossil fuels, which has reached 3.5 trillion yen, or 35 billion US dollars. We are facing a historically huge trade deficit, uh, and uh, we are on the verge of the current account deficit. Also, a nearly 10% electricity price hike has hit our industries, uh, industries and households. The high LNG price we pay, $16.16 per million uh, British thermal unit uh, compared to $3.5 in the US, 
has been one of the biggest issues uh, of our current situation. <coughs> resources are another issue. Although we have been trying to diversify the resources of natural gas, we st still depend on 20% through the threat of ohms. Half of the expanded demand of natural gas is coming from the Middle East, so our dependency on that uh, region is also rising. Those factors could stall the recovery of Japan's economy. <coughs> In addition to that, we have been cooperating with the US on Iran sanctions, and we are committed to reduce Iranian crude oil. The import from US would be the most reliable supply, which could bring about less dependency on the Middle East and further diversification of pricing. Last uh, but not least, uh, I'd like to express our hope to further strengthen the Japan and US win-win relationship. Uh, it goes without saying that the US-Japan alliance is a cornerstone of stability in the Asia-Pacific, and the energy should be one of the proponents of this alliance. USA, US LNG exports will reinforce that. <coughs> as such, our government would like to welcome the import of natural gas from the US as an ally. That will create more investment into the, into the US by Japanese firms uh, contributing uh, to the promotion of exports from the US and eventually higher employment. This new flow of natural gas should be a major factor for regional stability in Asia. In closing, I'd like to express our appreciation uh, for your support on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'd like to hear from uh, Singapore, which expects to double their LNG import uh, capability in the next uh, three years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of Congress. Thank you for inviting me here to participate in the discussion on the mutual benefits of LNG exports. I want to present a perspective, and as you said, Mr. Chairman, you know, there is a different perspective in Europe as there is from the Asia Pacific. And I want to present a perspective that also be expands beyond Singapore into Southeast Asia, which are all very close friends and partners of the United States. For the countries of Southeast Asia, the U.S. natural gas revolution has immense national and regional implications, as well as very important economic and strategic benefits for both the United States and for Asia. Speaking from Singapore's national perspective, we are obviously a very good friend of the United States. We have a bilateral free trade agreement that was concluded more than 10 years ago, the first Asian country to have a bilateral free trade agreement with the United States, and we're working together on a Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a very intense and strong economic relationship, and one that is also reinforced by a very strong security and strategic relationship as well. But there's something unique about Singapore. We are a small island state with no energy endowments of our own. Singapore, which is a highly developed country, relies on imports for all of our energy needs. In 2011, 78% of Singapore's electricity was generated by piped national, natural gas imported from our two immediate neighbors, Malaysia and Indonesia. But we've had to diversify our natural gas supply. Our neighbors need their own natural gas as well. So in, as part of this diversification, we have invested in opening an LNG import terminal. This import terminal, which has the capacity of 3.5 million uh, tons per annum, was opened in May this year. We are ex expanding this by putting in a third tank, which will increase its capacity to 6 million tons per annum by the end of this year. And we're planning to add a fourth tank to raise the terminal's throughput to 9 million tons per annum. So we're making all the necessary investments in order to have the LNG supply to diversify our energy needs. Today we have an LNG import license, which is with British Gas uh, Marketing, to sell up to 3 million tons per annum of LNG to Singapore, of which 90% has already been fulfilled. There is a huge demand for more gas, and we are assessing how to manage the future gas import framework. So in that context, the prospect of US LNG exports is attractive for potential supply security, competitive pricing, and as an alternative to our current pricing based on oil indexation. Regionally, while it will be commercial interests that drive the LNG trade, from the strategic perspective, the US also stands to make enormous gains from the increased energy trade with Asia. Increased LNG exports to Asia would further anchor the US economic presence and contribute to enhancing the region's energy security. 
In doing so, the U.S. would strengthen its partnerships in the region, serving regional stability and its global interests, and more importantly for all of you, creating jobs in the U.S. gas industry. In addition to that, what the region has been doing, as I said, I will speak a little bit on Southeast Asia, we are coming together to work on a number of projects as well with the United States. Singapore is currently the country co coordinator for the U.S. ASEAN Energy Cooperation, which includes cooperation on natural gas. Singapore has just joined the steering committee of the U.S.-Asia Pacific Comprehensive Energy Partnership, which was just announced in the meetings going on now in Southeast Asia, which also includes natural gas, as well as cooperation about power interconnectivity, renewable and clean energy, as well as sustainable development. In ASEAN itself, the 10 countries of ASEAN, we are pulling together a trans-ASEAN gas pipeline project over the next decade, and natural gas will be a very important component of this. With the U.S. interest in unconventional gas, we also see a strong technological expertise, which will help provide opportunities for U.S. companies to work in the ASEAN countries to help to unlock some of the un unconventional gas reserves that we have. So in addition to just exporting your gas, you're also exporting your technology. And I think all this presents great opportunities for how you, you focus on the Pacific, the Asia-Pacific, and working in the region in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you. And our cleanup hitter on our discussion on Asia is South Korea, who is a uh, longtime strategic ally, ally of the United States, uh, is the world's second largest importer of LNG, uh, and currently receives uh, uh, their two largest suppliers are Gutter uh, and I believe Indonesia. Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Barton, thank you so much. Chairman Whitfield and other members of the Energy Committee, thank you so much for convoking this meeting. But as a matter of fact, I've been listening to three presentations coming from Europe and three, three presentations coming from my Asian colleagues. And I, and I felt both rather thrilled as well as uh, concerned about one thing, which is all of them I just saying the same thing again and again, in the sense that they are very much encouraged about exploration and then exploitation of uh, shale gas, mainly shale gas from the United States. And then they are very much encouraged about it. And then, as a matter of fact, I should be saying the same thing. So that is the reason why I felt very much encouraged about it. But why I'm being concerned? Because, well, we often say when everybody agrees, then we just have to begin to be concerned if we are missing something. So that is the reason why uh, I felt both encouraged as well as concerned about all, all these commonalities of views coming from my Asia, uh, European as well as Asian colleagues. But as I said, Korea is of the same view. We are much encouraged about, about this uh, new sources of energy, which is called shale gas, and then mainly for three reasons. First of all, because of diversity of sources. And in Korea, as Mr. Barton has already pointed out, Korea is the second largest importer of oil. I, I'm, I'm sorry, LNG, maybe oil as well, but LNG. And the first importer, of course, is Japan, and then we are the second largest. And then uh, today, we are importing about 37 million tons of uh, LNG gas today. And then uh, among that 37 million, soon enough, we are going to import 3.7 million from the United States. Sabine Pass project, that of course is going to start back, uh, sometime in 2017. And then that project alone, it will be 3.7 million. And that, in fact, tells a lot about Korea's dependence upon LNG. And if we look into the energy portfolio of Korea, well, if we just start with electricity, 40% of our electricity comes from nuclear, another 40% from coal, 17% comes from LNG. And then between coal and natural gas, we are of the view that we should continue to reduce the dependence upon the coal and then have to increase uh, the use of uh, natural gas in the days to come. So it is 37 million today, but soon enough it could be increasing even further. So you could understand why we in Korea are much encouraged about this new source of uh, export opening up in the United States. And fortunately, uh, we have this Korea-US FTA, which entered into force 18 months ago. So that is the reason why we could uh, agree upon this Sabine Pass deal early enough. So that's something we are looking for to happen uh, between Korea and then the United States. So that was my first reason why we are encouraged about it. Second reason is 
well, many of my colleagues made, already made the same, same point, which is, well, it is not only about nat uh, natural gas, liquefied natural gas. What is important is it will be, in a sense, opening whole possibility of further strengthening relations between Korea and the, in the United States in, in all different areas. Well, let us just think about, say, industrial cooperation or economic cooperation. There was Ambassador of Lithuania, and then he just mentioned about this LNG tanks and LNG facilities coming from Korea. And then when it comes to LNG carriers and then LNG facilities, then of course there are a large number of Korean firms working on those ships as well as facilities. Not to speak about all those line pipes coming from Korea uh, in the construction of all those uh, pipelines in this country. And of course it will have very positive impact upon, uh, upon the U.S. economy as well as Korean economy. And then that way, of course, uh, this year, we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of mutual security treaty between Korea and then the United States. But this uh, LNG project, or projects in uh, plural, would certainly be uh, serving as opportunities to further strengthen very important bilateral relationship between Korea and then the United States. So that is the second reason why we are encouraged in Korea. And then there is a third, even a third reason why we, in fact, are looking forward to for the strengthening this relationship with the United States, which is impact upon emission control, climate change. Because we made a commitment in Korea to reduce the emission of uh, uh, CO2s by, by year two, uh, 2020, 30% uh, reduction in comparison with BAO. There is to business as usual emission of uh, greenhouse gases. And then in order to do it, as I already mentioned, then of course we will have to decrease dependence, dependence upon the coal and have to increase the, uh, the use of uh, LNG. So that is the third reason why we are much encouraged about this new source of energy, uh, cleaner energy than coal, uh, coming on, online. So at the very least, we, for those three reasons, we are very encouraged about uh, about all those developments of uh, natural gas in this country. And then we look forward to working more closely with you in the days to come. And then when I say with you, then of course it is with the United States, everybody in the United States, but to begin with, members of the Energy Committee in the U.S. Uh, US Congress. Thank you so much. We want to thank each of our four um, uh, ambassadors from Asia for your comments. We're not going to open it up to questions from the members on the, on the House side. And we're going to start with Mr. McNerney of California. Well, again, I want to echo, uh, echo a thank you for, for coming and uh, giving us your comments today, including the Europeans. Um, this is a, a tremendous opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, stabilize the market, to, uh, to make sure that oil and, and um, um, petroleum prices don't uh, cause too much market havoc, which has, has happened too many times in the past. Um, and it's also an opportunity for us to build our strategic alliances, as has been mentioned several times. Uh, it's helpful. Uh, to have a diversity of suppliers, especially when one or two players can be bad actors on occasion and cause disruptions and insecurity. So for these reasons, we should move ahead aggressively, I think, in developing uh, liquid natural gas exports with the provision that American uh, manufacturers, American supplies don't uh, spike the prices and so that our manufacturers can continue to count on, on stable uh, prices. Uh, the one caution, of course, is that we live in an era where we can no longer uh, dump uh, carbon and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere with complete abandon. Uh, we have to be careful about how we move forward in the future. Uh, natural gas is, uh, is much better in terms of greenhouse gas emissions um, than other forms of petroleum, uh, other forms of fossil fuels, with one uh, provision is that uh, we don't leak natural gas into the atmosphere. And so my question uh, has two parts. First of all, I'd like to get some assurance that uh, when, you, when your countries um, import natural gas, do you have the technology uh, and, and the latest uh, in terms of pipelines to make sure that we don't leak uh, natural gas into the atmosphere uh, because a significant portion of natural gas is uh, taken from leakage uh, in, in these pipelines and in applications? And secondly, uh, some assurance that this is going to help you reduce emissions of, of uh, carbon dioxide uh, in the long run in your, in your, in your country. So if you would uh, take those questions, uh, I'd appreciate it, starting with Mr. Sandu. Uh,
As far as infrastructure is concerned, Congressman, uh, we are uh, putting in uh, uh, infrastructure, especially focusing so that when we are receiving uh, LNG from the United States, we would be in position to receive that and utilize it. Uh, the clean energy aspect, in fact, uh, we are committed to increasing the proportion of clean energy in our total energy consumption, which I mentioned to you in case of India is uh, huge, our requirements. And uh, as a bridge between traditional fossil fuels and clean energy resources, expanded use of LNG, uh, in fact, is an important component of our environmentally sensitive energy security strategy. Well, I mean, think uh, India in particular in a position to uh, develop your infrastructure uh, for natural gas uh, distribution. There's plenty of good equipment out there uh, and, and some suppliers from around the United States and, and other countries. So I'd like to just ask that you use the best equipment, use the latest technology to make sure that you have those uh, emissions under control. Uh, we are paying attention to that, Congressman, and noted. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, responding to your first question, uh, technologies. Actually, Japan uh, is a leading importing country of LNG, and we have uh, uh, about uh, 50 years uh, experience on that. Uh, so uh, in uh, every uh, process, uh, we have, uh, I'm sure that we have a uh, technology uh, to satisfy uh, the environmental concern. And uh, as for your second question, uh, of course, uh, the uh, using uh, natural gas uh, comparing to using uh, crude oil or uh, coal, uh, it, uh, it would, uh, using uh, natural gas uh, would contribute to the CO2 emission. So uh, that is uh, one reason uh, uh, we like to uh, expand uh, our uh, consumption of natural gas, including from the US. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for letting me address this aspect of the discussion because I think it's a very important aspect that we have to look at on the whole environmental bit. I mentioned that Singapore is, has got no energy resources of our own. In addition to that, we are actually geographically disadvantaged from being able to use renewables as well. We have neither the space to set up a nuclear power plant. We, cannot, we have no strong winds that we can use wind technology. Even the solar technology which we are rolling out, given how urbanized we are, is a very difficult sort of prospect. So we are really reliant on uh, oil and gas, and we are converting more and more to gas as the option. When you speak of the technology, we have built the latest uh, LNG receiving terminal, which just opened six months ago. We've been taking in pipe natural gas for a number of years, and this has gone fairly... Uh, and no problems with that. And we expect to keep always ahead of the game in terms of technology. We're a small geographical island. We have to protect that island. We have to make sure that everything we do is environmentally sustainable because for our five million people on that small island, there is no other option. That's all we have. So we're very conscious about this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Congressman. Well, with respect to your second question, will it help to reduce emissions in Korea? Definitely it will. And then I just listened to Ambassador of Singapore, and then when he says, well, we are not making comparison between renewables, nuclear, and fossil fuels. We are making comparison among fossil fuels itself. So between, say, coal and petrol and gas, of course, uh, gas would be least polluting. So in that sense, of course, uh, definitely it will help. So it will lead us to the first question, which is, what about the technology? And then with respect to technology, then, and, then, and then more specifically about leak, then the leak would be, uh, well, happening through the whole life cycle of uh, gas in the sense that uh, in the process of exploration, in the process of uh, gas uh, liquefaction, and in the process of transportation, in the process of gasification, and in the, in the process of uh, distribution. So leak would be pa uh, taking place at various different stages. When it comes to leak in the process of exploration, then there is uh, something you must be concerned about in the United States, as well as leak during the process of uh, liquefaction. But when it comes to leak during the process of transportation and leak during the process of gasification, leak during the process of uh, distribution, Mr. Congressman, I can tell you that so far our record uh, is 
something uh, with which we can be satisfied and with which we can be proud. Because we're taking about uh, the leak which take place, uh, place during the process of transportation. For example, much of it is being done by the Korea uh, gas, co gas company. It, uh, the percentage of leak is 0.1 percent, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, very low in comparison with other, say, uh, most of uh, other countries' transportation system. So we are working on it, and then uh, where 0.1 percent, we still want to reduce it even further. And then we can say almost the same thing with respect to leak, which takes place during the gasification as well as during the distribution. Thank you. Hear from Mr. Turner and then Mr. Terry and then Mr. McCannell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, turning to Ambassador Akahoshi, um, the, um, thank you for your presentation, the description and the discussion of your, your market. Um, the, as I understand it, um, Japan, in, uh, for example, in 2010, uh, Russia, Middle East, and North Africa were 34 percent of the gas needs for Japan. That rose in 2011 to 40 percent, and my understanding is that now um, 50 percent of Japan's LNG imports came from Russia, Middle East, and North Africa. We know Russia um, is an <clears throat> inconsistent supplier used and will use energy as a, um, to advance their political um, and uh, geopolitical needs. Uh, Middle East and North Africa are also um, frequently uh, you know, unstable. But the issue of um, this gas raises uh, the issue of the price. Japan pays nearly six times uh, the uh, market-based price of the United States. Um, it's my understanding also that just recently the Gas Exporting Countries Forum, which is an OPEC-like organization, um, held uh, a meeting continuing under uh, uh, Putin's uh, encouragement to tie natural gas prices to oil prices. Um, the um, uh, U.S. prices, of course, are market rate. Uh, I had asked our European allies to describe if the United States had, be had uh, indicated its willingness to begin the export process, what effects it would have, and they indicated its, its effect would be, uh, be felt uh, immediate. Uh, for Japan also, would that be the case? The bill that I have, bicameral, bipartisan, that would um, include our NATO allies also includes Japan. Um, if, um, if we were to say that, uh, that we were beginning that process of um, having that lowering the barrier for export to Japan, uh, would it have a, an immediate effect uh, for you in, in natural gas as we prepare the logistics of getting it there? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, regarding the high price, uh, which I mentioned as 16 MMBTU compared to 3.5 or 4 uh, in the US, uh, the reason of uh, the high price is uh, uh, we don't have uh, much uh, competition uh, in Asia. So uh, for our uh, colleagues uh, uh, from Europe, uh, there is a, at least competition uh, of uh, LNG and uh, pipeline gas, but uh, Japan doesn't have any pipeline. Uh, so oh, there is a cost, additional cost, uh, which is called as uh, uh, Asia, Asia Premium. Uh, so we ha usually uh, it is said that we have to pay uh, maybe around three dollars uh, more than Europe, uh, but uh, maybe uh, much more. And uh, regarding the uh, timing, uh, timing issues, uh, actually, uh, actually, uh, we need it uh, as soon as possible, <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, as I uh, explained uh, at my opening remarks, uh, we are suffering uh, from uh, uh, tremendous uh, amount uh, of uh, trade uh, deficit. Uh, so. Uh, uh, again, I'd like to uh, get uh, uh, natural gas uh, from the U.S. Uh, as soon as possible, but uh, uh, it would take uh, some time uh, until uh, we really import uh, the natural gas. So actually, we have uh, there are, there are uh, two projects uh, which has already uh, got uh, approval uh, from uh, Energy Depart Department. But uh, it would take time to uh, construct the facility, and we have to wait uh, the expansion of uh, Panama K 
canal. Uh, so uh, actual timing, uh, uh, which uh, when uh, we can import uh, from the US uh, would be uh, 2017. 2017. So anyway, uh, I hope uh, that uh, uh, U.S. Uh, government, uh, with the support uh, of your committees, uh, would uh, uh, give uh, approval for uh, another uh, other application as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for our Pacific partners, I'll ask the same question for the TPP. Are your respective countries engaged in discussions on uh, our export to you of LNG? Is that part of the TPP discussions? Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, both TPP and uh, uh, import of uh, U.S. Uh, natural gas uh, both are uh, important uh, for us, and uh, uh, we are uh, actually we joined uh, formally uh, to the TPP negotiation in last July, and uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, negotiators, uh, have been working quite hard uh, to catch up to and uh, to further contribute to the uh, negotiations, and uh, uh, we share uh, the goal uh, to uh, conclude uh, the negotiation uh, by uh, end of this year. End of this year. But uh, even if uh, that is the case, uh, every country is, uh, needs a domestic process uh, such, such as uh, ratification uh, in Congress and, and uh, yet. Uh, so uh, 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 it will take time to uh, take effect. Uh, but as I explained uh, to uh, Mr. Turner's questions, uh, uh, our uh, demand for natural gas is more uh, urgent uh, issues. Uh, so at this moment, uh, we uh, think uh, 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 we regard uh, TPP and uh, natural gas export issues uh, separately. Uh, but uh, does, does it make sense? Your question. If I can add, Singapore is a TPP partner and is the only other TPP partner on this panel. But more importantly, we're already a bilateral free trade partner. So we can get natural gas under a bilateral free trade agreement. The TPP is a more, much broader agreement that brings together 12 countries. I haven't seen the final text. We're still in the stage of negotiation. I presume energy will be in there in some fashion or other, and we'll have to see how that fits in. But I think it's an important component of how we address the wider sort of economic architecture that is being shaped in that region using the TPP. But Singapore is a bilateral free trade partner. You know, this is uh, something that we can do immediately. Thank you. Well, as the Congressman already knows, we are, uh, Korea is not yet participating in the uh, negotiation for the TPP. But fortunately for us, we entered into FTA with the United States 18 months ago. So for the time being, we, in fact, are benefiting uh, fr from, from that status as, as, a, as, a, as a FTA uh, partner of the United States. That, in fact, helps us when we negotiate for input of uh, natural gas from, from, from the United States. Thank you. Mr. McKinley, and then we have Mr. Green and Mr. Olson, and I'll wrap it up for the Asia discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, in this room and on the floor of the House, uh, we've had four votes taken to ban exporting natural gas. And we've defeated all of those, those four. But when I've spoken to the proponent, they've indicated that their rationale for it was to discourage other nations from using fossil fuels. But I've listened to your testimony, and you've had, you have other sources. If we're not buying from America, you're going to buy it from someone else. I've seen everyone kind of nod, yes, that's accurate. So the other idea was that they would force you into renewables, that you wouldn't use natural gas. You wouldn't use coal and you wouldn't use petroleum, but you would use wind and solar and nuclear, hydro. I've not heard that a lot of what else you're doing. Um, I think that some of you are trying to do that, but I, I, I'm, 
I'm just curious now, this is the first opportunity to listen to other nations about the effects that had any of those amendments passed, what effect that would have had on your nation. My question goes a little further beyond that, and that is that the World Bank has come out in opposition to use of coal. And pretty clear that that's the first step. And I think it doesn't take much of imagination to understand that the next step would be natural gas and then petroleum. Do you, do each of you see that as a possibility? Can you envision if the World Bank is successful stopping funding for coal-fired gen electric generation, do you see it potentially be expanded then if they're successful with that? to go in after other fossil fuels and other, and other means of trying to follow an ideology of reducing greenhouse gases and what effect that would have on your nation if you couldn't burn LNG? You start. Any thoughts? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, mention that uh, uh, from uh, West Virginia, uh, we uh, bought uh, uh, coal uh, in 2012, last year. Uh, it's increased, uh, import of coal uh, from West Virginia is uh, increased uh, by 10 times uh, comparing with previous year. So that's because uh, of uh, the uh, Fukushima uh, incident. Uh, but uh, that also means that uh, uh, we still would like to uh, continue to use the coal. And uh, uh, actually, I uh, will note uh, that there has been a debate uh, on coal generations uh, in World Bank, as you mentioned, and uh, in the United States. Uh, we believe that the generation cost is uh, much cheaper and the coal uh, ex exists throughout uh, the world, so it is uh, essential energy resources for Asia, uh, where energy demand has been growing rapidly. Uh, we also note uh, that there is the issue of uh, CO2 emissions, uh, but regarding this, uh, Japan has been leading the effort uh, towards development and commercial introduction of super-efficient coal thermal generating plants such as integrated coal gasification combined cycle IGCC. So we like to carry on such efforts and uh, further uh, deployment, uh, especially in developing countries, uh, so, we can com so that we can contribute to finding a solution uh, for global warming. Thank you very much. I think in many ways you had the answers to your question, sir. I mean, we, we respect your domestic processes as you have to go through them, but we are already buying LNG from various competitive sources until the U.S. is ready to export to Asia. And Australia is exporting, the Caribbean countries are exporting, Qatar is exporting. So it's a competitive global market, and uh, that is what sets the prices in many ways. In terms of renewables, Singapore really does not have those options. We wish we did, unless it's going to be a very dramatic change in technology. It is not something that we see realistically in the foreseeable future. Because of the expense, do you think? Because of the size of our country. Is, the size is not The size there. of the country. We just have no ability to use renewable resources. We worked in other ways to convince people to be energy efficient. We work around smart grids. But that is the best we can do. We have no other way to, we have no geography that allows us to be able to use renewable energy. And that's just the, the geographical disadvantage of being a small island state uh, like Singapore. So we need to protect our environment. We're con very much conscious of that. We have uh, worked to make sure that the whole network is much more energy efficient. But it is a competitive market, and we are a developed country, and development means we need energy. Everything we do needs energy. We can't unplug everything and say we're going to step back. So unless there's a dramatic technological change, maybe in the next 50 years or 60 years, I don't see it in the foreseeable future, then maybe something can change. But at least for the next 30, 40, 50 years, we will continue to be dependent on what we have, imported energy, and that's all we can rely on. Should developing nations be concerned if the World Bank were to 
turn its attention to also including a, a opposition to natural gas? Yes, it is with, with coal now. I, I cannot speak for the World Bank of what is driving their perspective and you know, how they want to manage that. But if they can come up with alternatives for developing countries, energy disadvantaged countries, that give them an alternative, then that's something for them to come up with it. I, it's really for them to then say that you must have an alternative. We have no option for hydropower. We don't have major rivers or there's nothing that we can do that we can use something as alternatively. So it's, I think it's incumbent on whoever you know, shapes that energy future to come out with alternatives and make it viable, economically viable, because you cannot have something that's so expensive as well to use. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in Korea, we come up with five-year energy plan, and then this is the year. This year, we will come up with five-year energy plan, and then, and then in that energy plan, we will look into all this uh, energy portfolio, the, the, the composition of different sources of energy. And then, of course, we are looking at renewable, nuclear, and fossil fuels. When it comes to renewable, for the time being, about 3% uh, of our energy comes from the renewables. And uh, I guess by year 2030, we are planning to increase by 8%. But it is by year 20, 2030. Until that time, then of course we have to depend upon bridge uh, sources of energy, which will be nuclear, which will be fossil fuel. When it comes to nuclear, as I already mentioned, about 40% of our electricity already comes from nuclear. And then given all those uh, various other factors, we have to think about the nuclear, nuclear energy because of uh, dependability of uh, supply of uh, nuclear fuels as well as management of spent fuels and then political oppositions, etc., etc. I don't know how much higher up we could go, be going when we already have about 40% of our uh, electricity coming from nuclear. And then it comes to fossil fuels. And then fossil fuels, among fossil fuels, then of course uh, natural gas for the time being is the least polluting. And then that is the reason why in Korea we welcome wider use of uh, fossil fuel. But when it comes to coal, then, as I understand it, uh, well, there, there is an aspect about the technology. There, are, there, there is development of technology, which will be, uh, even if it, it is uh, burning the coal, which will be uh, uh, emitting less, uh, less greenhouse gases. So the technology is there. And then I think, uh, well, for the time being, as I already mentioned, looking at all these different sources of energy, fossil fuel, for at least for a foreseeable uh, period of time, then we will have to depend upon it. Upon it. Thank you. For our final question on the Asia situation, Mr. Olson of Texas. I thank my colleague from Texas and welcome to our uh, diplomats from Asia. I've actually been to three of your five countries in my naval career. I spent uh, about six months uh, deployed to Japan. I was up on the Misawa, on the island of Hokkaido, northern Japan, and spent some time down in Okinawa at Kadena. I spent a week in uh, Korea in uh, January, very, very cold. Beautiful day, but really, really cold. And some time in Thailand as well. I need to go to Singapore and India. And my questions are about India to you, Mr. Sandhu. Um, I have a very large Indo-American population back home in Texas 22. And I've had many meetings with the Council General there, Council General Harish. And he's been very articulate and persuasive as to why India needs U.S. LNG. And I would like you to go into some details about how India's energy status quo, maintain that status quo, is hurting your growth and your security. And he's been very articulate. He's described pipelines won't work. A pipeline can't come from the west because it's got to go through Pakistan. It can't come from the north because you've got to cross the Himalayas. It can't come from the east because those countries are getting less stable. It has to come on ships and that means it should be coming from the United States of America, in my opinion. So again, can you describe how Amer India's need for energy, how maintain your status quo, you can't grow, and how it impacts your security? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the energy requirements in India are tremendous, and we need to, we need to Diversify, we are trying to diversify from different resources. As you have mentioned that we do live in a difficult neighborhood and 
the pipelines have not worked essentially because of that. They were on the plans, but, and therefore, United States or India is a very important source. It's an important source for its reliability and some of the aspects which you have already mentioned. And it's also a very commercially viable resource for us. Now, as far as uh, the infrastructure is concerned, we are already uh, working on that. Uh, in fact, we are cooperating with some of the United States companies and we look forward to more investments in that particular area. Uh, in fact, some of the projects are already in place and possibly by end of 16 and 17, our coastline, we will have the capability to be able to absorb the gas which will come from the United States. Well, thank you, sir, and that concludes my questions. One invitation for everybody here. Uh, there's a great festival, Indo-American festival in all across the country, but it happens all across the world. But the largest one in America happens in Fort Bend County. It's called the Holy. And I know Mr. Sandu knows about it. It's very festive. It's called the Festival of, of Color. And basically, you have these little bags of pastels that you just throw all over at people. It's a lot, a lot of fun. So come on out to Fort Bend County in February or March time frame. I yield right. back. We thank you for that cultural update. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Mr. Whitfield. Thank the ambassadors from Asia for your participation. Yeah, you're inviting everyone to this, uh, Pete, or? It you can come by, but I warn you, the clothes you wear are done. Okay. They're staying forever, and you'll be getting stuff out of your ears for a long, long time. It's a lot of fun. Well, Joe, thank you, and thank you all for giving us information about Southeast Asia. We appreciate your perspective. Uh, now we're moved to the Caribbean, and we have representatives from two uh, Caribbean countries, uh, Dr. Shamo from uh, Haiti and uh, Dr. O'Neill from Puerto Rico. So, uh, Dr. Shamo, we'll begin with you, and if you'll give us uh, perspectives on Haiti, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, and thank you to all the honorable congressmen for inviting us to this uh, very important forum. For Haiti, the situation is, um, is at, to say the least, critical. And uh, what we're talking about right now is uh, energy security and the the need for energy is is key for every other aspect of the, of a developing nation. Um, Haiti right now is um, almost entirely dependent on importing uh, for its energy. About seventy seventy five percent of the uh, energy or electricity produced is produced via uh, heavy fuel oil or diesel. Uh, the 25 percent remaining is, is hydropower. Um, the, when we look at the development of, of uh, what's happening in LNG, I think it's been said enough here today that the, this availability of LNG is creating more competition, and therefore better prices for this energy resource. And um, these supplies, I think uh, Congressman Turner mentioned it earlier, that these supplies are creating um, a, a, uh, improved prices where the prices are no longer tied to, to oil prices. And for us, it's, it's extremely important. The, The market prices, uh, we're looking at the difference between using diesel and HFO and using uh, LNG can create reduction of, uh, of the cost of electricity by at least 30%. And in, and in, in you know, optimistic cases, we could even reach 50%. So that, that makes a, an enormous difference as far as Haiti is concerned. The... U.S. has been very supportive of uh, Haiti's development, and in the past, most of the of the international support to Haiti has been in terms of humanitarian aid. We are in this the present administration of uh, President Martelly making an enormous effort to go from a trade-based. Uh, 
relationship, an aid-based relationship, pardon me, to a trade-based relationship. The idea being that we uh, encourage more investment, we open more to, uh, to uh, the development of businesses, uh, and that gives us the opportunity to become more and more self-dependent, self-reliant. Uh, the, the issue of, I think it was, uh, it was um, Congressman McKinley who talked about the World Bank uh, opposition to uh, the use of coal and the possibility of, of uh, that, the effect of that opposition to continue on to other fossil fuels. Uh, we have we have um, been subject to that, and and because of that, it's been difficult to consider uh, using coal to reduce um, electricity prices. Therefore, I mean, it was our only option, and we were going to fight for it. But LNG gives us a, another option, uh, and a much better one in, in terms of of uh, the environment, reduction of greenhouse green, greenhouse uh, gases, and uh, reduction of pollution. Also, uh, Congressman, you mentioned the question of why not use uh, renewables. Obviously, we're being encouraged to use renewables, and we are d developing our capacity to do so. However, uh, it must be understood that renewables cannot, or, or very difficult, it's very difficult to give uh, base power using renewables because of, of their intermittent nature. The solar energy is available during the day only, and whenever a cloud passes, the, there's, a, there's obvious variations, and wind energy is unpredictable. Therefore, it's, it's necessary to have a large uh, uh, base power uh, source uh, in order to, to use renewables. Renewables will allow to reduce the, the use of that, uh, that resource, be it uh, diesel, be it gas, uh, natural gas, be it nuclear or coal. Those are, those are forms of base power that can be used, uh, and then the, the use of, of uh, the renewables will help to reduce the, the, the use of those forms. Therefore, it's very difficult, uh, as some of the uh, institutions as, like the World Bank uh, try to put us in a situation where we should focus uh, primarily on renewables. It's very, very difficult, and uh, I think that's what was said earlier by some of, some of the uh, presenters here. The, um, there was an issue, a very in, important issue for the U.S. of what, what is the interest of the U.S. F to, to, be, uh, to export. And I think, I'm, I'm sure this has come up in, during the votes to try to ban export of, of uh, LNG. Is even though Haiti is a small country, uh, a very small country compared to some of these present here, but the the United States has already helped Haiti by investing in our uh, infrastructure, and uh, not notably in uh, electricity production, and the availability of LNG would allow us to leverage the the support that's already been given to us so that we can produce electricity at better prices and, and, and in a, a cleaner, cleaner way. Also, the, the um, investment that this would allow, uh, there are direct foreign investment that we are looking for, and there are, there are a number of investors in various areas, but starting with investors uh, who are interested in, in, in energy, uh, a lot of them are, are because of the of the uh, closeness to the U.S. We're about 1,400 miles away. A lot of the investors are from the U.S., so therefore there would be American investors who would be in, who are interested in investing in, in Haiti. And if we have uh, if we open up this market, this creates a new market for investment. Now, all other forms of investment are dependent upon the availability of, of uh, things like, uh, of, uh, things like uh, low labor costs and, and availability of other things, and in particular, uh, low electricity costs make us competitive so that the investors would be interested 
and it would create, therefore, jobs even for for the U.S., mm -hmm. let alone for us in Haiti, which which is what we're working to, very hard towards. Um, the I think the last point the last point I'd like to make is that we could talk a lot about numbers. I mean, there are excellent numbers that make the case for LNG uh, use, LNG export from the U.S. in particular. But the main issue for Haiti is a, is a human issue. Uh, we're talking about a, a country with, uh, right now, the, the, uh, the GDP is about $1,300 per, per, uh, per uh, inhabitant. The, um, the situation after the earthquake in 2010 was dramatic, and we, have, we are still trying to recuperate from that. Uh, the, the question of energy is central to every type of, of issue of development that we can consider. Uh, the question of electricity in particular. And being able to reduce our electricity prices would give us the possibility to, to give access to more people. We are in Haiti only, about, only able to give access to 30% of the population to electricity. And that is, it's obviously the, the, mm. the worst situation in the Americas, North, South, and Caribbean. And um, this is, for us, an issue so important that, that uh, even though we have very limited resources, I thought it was extremely important to come here and try to make that point. And in closing, the, the poverty issues create a lot of illegal immigrants towards the U.S. If we can create more jobs, uh, more, a better quality of life for, for people in Haiti, uh, we could grow our economy. All those things would reduce the impact of, the, of, of poverty and, and the, this, the pressure that all of these Haitians feel that make them leave Haiti even when it's illegal. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Chimot, thank you very much. And I might say that we do take note uh, of the World Bank's policies because we've had many representatives of developing countries come to the Congress and say that the World Bank seems to be much more interested in addressing its climate change policy than it does eradicating poverty and helping improve living conditions. And that's something that's come through loud and clear from a lot of different countries, and we appreciate your mentioning that. Uh, our next speaker from the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, uh, Dr. O'Neill, we recognize you for your comments. Thank you. On behalf of the Governor of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, Alejandro Garcia Padilla, I thank the Chairman and all the members of the Committee on Energy and Commerce for giving Puerto Rico this opportunity to discuss the importance of increased U.S. LNG exports uh, to our island. Unlike the other participants in, in this forum, Puerto Rico is a U.S. jurisdiction and Puerto Ricans are American citizens by birth. Yet, Puerto Rico is overly dependent on foreign oil for both transportation and electricity, with limited access to affordable natural gas, unlike the states. As a result, when the average price of a barrel of oil increases by $10, it is estimated that $700 million leave Puerto Rico's economy in a year. This acts as a drag on the island's economy. Under the leadership of Governor Garcia Padilla, we are executing a plan to decrease our dependence on foreign oil, to stabilize energy prices, and spur economic development. This plan incorporates the increased use of renewable energy resources, which Puerto Rico has no short shortage of. Natural gas is a key element in this transition, particularly as a substitute for oil in electric power-based generation. We are in the process of converting oil-fired power plants to natural gas and have commenced the federal permitting process for an offshore LNG storage and regas regasification facility. Therefore, timely approval and construction of U.S. LNG export facilities represent a potential source of stability of fuel supply and prices to Puerto Rico, and it would increase the viability of the investments that we are already making. I look forward to discussing this uh, situation further 
and answering any questions that the committee members may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. O'Neill. Any questions? Um, Morgan? Well, I would just like to say from one commonwealth to another, uh, we'll be glad to, you know, I'll be glad to do anything that I can to assist in that. But I'm going to ask uh, Mr. McKinley's question, and, and I know that uh, the gentleman from India didn't get a chance to answer that, and that is, you know, what are the likelihoods uh, of uh, not being able to use coal, or do you use coal currently? I know you want to use the gas because it's uh, a little bit cleaner. And also, what are the, what are the chances uh, that you all could use uh, renewables and what, what work is being done in that regard? And does that work for your, um, your area? Okay, we, we currently uh, uh, use coal for 14% of our electric power generation. We have a one plant, it's an independent power producer. Um, in terms of natural gas, we already have a, 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 also an independent power producer that uses natural gas. Uh, it is a privately owned um, import uh, facility. And uh, we are currently in the process of um, permitting a second facility, which would be a, a partnership with a U.S. company uh, for the operation, but the supply aspects will be completely controlled by the, by the government. So that's, uh, that's what one of our key or cornerstones in our transition to, to natural gas. Um, in terms of renewable energy, we uh, have enough sunshine throughout the year to meet our electric energy demand if we had a, an, an effective way to store all that energy. However, there's no way to store that. So um, uh, the potential is still there, but ob obviously, as the colleague from, from Haiti was saying, the intermittency issues are, are, are a, a, a challenge to deal with. There are ways um, uh, to integrate and to deal with those, but um, since our electric infrastructure was based on the assumption that we have a stable input of fuel, uh, the infrastructure um, uh, is very limited in the way it can integrate that intermittency. Uh, but we are working on that. Uh, in terms of how can we improve our infrastructure and natural gas is actually a very important aspect of that transition because what we envision is that we will, ha we will um, uh, uh, not only retrofit our, our oil fire units to burn natural gas, but in the short term commence um, uh, 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 substituting those plants by uh, plants that can react faster to uh, uh, variations in the power grid that would be created by renewable energy. So it's our, our plan is, a, is an integrated uh, portfolio of alternatives that includes uh, natural gas, includes uh, renewable energy, and very important for our governor is um, efficiency and conservation. So we, we, are, we uh, definitely support uh, renewable energy. Um, we do understand uh, its limitations, and that's why we are uh, uh, approaching it in a very integrated way. And if I might, Mr. Chairman, it, it, if I understand from the answer to your question, what you're saying is, is that at this point there's not really any marketable way to store the solar, even though you can use it when it's available, but, you, but there's no really way for you all to store it. It would be too expensive to build the infrastructure for storage. In a, a, at a small scale, like for a house or for a small uh, a commercial uh, uh, facility, it, it, it might be uh, um, uh, financially um, uh, suitable. There are some places in Puerto Rico that, that for example, um, are not elect uh, electrified. There are not many, but there are a few spots where uh, getting power to those places would be very expensive, and people have decided to go standalone. But uh, comparing the option of going standalone with batteries versus uh, grid connection, still we are not there yet. So uh, the way we are fostering renewable energy uh, is, uh, for example, th through net metering. So we still need the grid, we still need base generation, and, uh, but in the, uh, uh, at the same time, we're fostering the mo a more increased use of renewable energy. So it, it's a combined mix. So it, you, you still need the base generation, and for the foreseeable future, uh, um, uh, renewable energy will be an important uh, uh, part of our energy portfolio, and we want to use as most uh, the maximum level possible of renewable energy, but we understand its limitations, and uh, we're working to um, um, uh, improve our grid to allow the, 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 the maximum use possible of renewable energy. Mr. Chairman? Would well, you ask him a question, Ronnie? Well, he, he actually never got a chance to answer Mr. McKinley's question earlier, and so I was kind of curious as to what his answer to that sure, would have been. Sure, absolutely. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as far as India is concerned, uh, we, of course, uh, we are making an effort to uh, move towards clean sources. However, it is significant de uh, dependent on coal. And as we have, we, we just cannot disregard the development needs of millions of people. And therefore, this is not going to happen overnight. Uh, while the efforts are on, but there are two ways we are trying to tackle the coal aspect. One, uh, we are trying to move towards clean coal technology, and we are working with the United States on that. And second would be LNG. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for hosting this forum. I want to thank all our members and our ambassadors. Uh, I think this has been a, it's something we haven't done very often, but it's been very helpful to me and I, I hope to our, our friends in the international community. I don't have a question for the Caribbean group, but I do have a request to the gentleman from Haiti. I have a constituent issue that I would like to speak with you uh, in private about, if I could. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Lee? Yeah, I'm curious uh, with our brother Commonwealth. Uh, it, it, since nearly 70 percent of the electrical generation is from petroleum, has uh, Puerto Rico established a, a forward-looking plan establishing capital uh, to switch those, uh, retrofit to natural gas, and if so, uh, what is that plan generally, mm -hmm. and, and does that include additional LNG receiving terminals? Yes. Um, as, as I was mentioning earlier, there are two independent power producers in the island. One uses coal and the other one uses natural gas. The rest of the generation, as the gentleman says, about 70% of our, of our installed capacity is basically uh, government-owned. It's a public corporation. And it's uh, uh, um, until a few years ago, all of them were burning uh, oil. One of the facilities, the one that is closer to, to the um, independent power producer that burns natural gas, is now burning natural gas also. Uh, there's a short pipeline that connects uh, that fa the, the private facility to, our, uh, to the government-owned uh, facility. So currently, uh, we already switched that one plant, which is a, a, uh, about 14% of our, of our uh, installed capacities in that plant. The, um, um, we are currently in the federal permitting stage of, of getting a, uh, an, NL, an a LNG storage and regasification uh, facility in, a, in our largest power plant, which is in Aguirre. That's in the south uh, eastern side of the island. And uh, that plant is uh, about 1,400 uh, megawatts. So it's a very large plant. It represents 25% of our um, electric power uh, installed capacity. Yes, 25%. Uh, and um, we are hoping to begin construction if, uh, if uh, all the, all the uh, uh, environmental process is done by, by next year. And, and, and we're hoping to have that facility running by 2015. We have uh, uh, the urgent need to move out, out of uh, uh, oil because uh, EPA's uh, new regulations uh, require us uh, to do so in our largest plants. So <clears throat> that uh, large plant will definitely uh, reduce our, our energy costs dramatically, and we're looking forward to having uh, U.S.-based, U.S.-produced uh, natural gas come into Puerto Rico and, and help us uh, reduce that. We are currently in the process of um, identifying um, sources for long-term contracts um, for the lowest possible prices, and, and, and um, uh, in that process, which uh, the information stage um, ended a few uh, weeks ago, uh, there are uh, a few of the um, uh, um, LNG export um, companies that are um, currently uh, being licensed, like Chenier and, uh, and, and Cameron, or they already are, are licensed, actually. Uh, they, they have permits. Uh, so. The challenge right now is that we are against the clock in terms of EPA's uh, MATS regulations, which, which uh, kick in in 2015. Uh, if we show progress, that 
might be extended one more year, 2016, but basically 2016 is a very firm uh, uh, deadline if we show progress. So uh, right now we are, we're in a very um, uh, um, a committed process to transfer uh, and, and make the investments to convert or all our large oil burning facilities to burn natural gas. That's all. And, and we're in that process. Uh, the, uh, as I said, the Aguirre plant will be done by 2015. And the northern plants, which are the two other plants uh, that we have that we need to convert to natural gas, should be done in that time frame of 2016, 2017. Is there uh, any barriers from the uh, Jones Act that's interfering with our ability to uh, move LNG from our Gulf Coast shores of Louisiana and places to Puerto Rico? Uh, the, uh, the Jones Act uh, would increase transportation costs uh, uh, in terms of um, getting the LNG uh, to Puerto Rico. So in, in, in that regard, it presents an additional cost uh, for uh, U.S.-based uh, 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 natural gas. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, Dr. from Haiti, I appreciate you being here. Um, and my question, it, it, reading your materials, is that most of the electrical generation that there is in Haiti seems to be off of diesel generators. And uh, with a high degree of sulfur within there, not the low sulfur diesel. And so it seems to me, as, as Mr. Whitfield had mentioned with World Bank, uh, creating natural gas facilities uh, to increase the level of electrical generation and reliability would actually be something I would think would be in the World Bank's sweet spot. Um, th so that's just my editorial. Uh, second is, uh, you mentioned also the U.S. help. Uh, is the $103 million due to do that one power plant, the small one. Uh, is that the only infrastructure uh, dollars that you've received, uh, that Haiti has received from the U.S. regarding an electrical generation? Uh, no. There, there is uh, the, the power plant that you mentioned in the northeast of the country that is associated with a, um, um, an industrial park, a new industrial park that is being built, uh, that has been built and is, and is continuing to develop, and that was with the support of the U.S. and also the in the in the cap, the central part of the country and the capital, the uh, U.S. has helped to rehabilitate the electric the existing electrical system. In particular, a uh, number of substations were were totally uh, revamped, about uh, five of them. So there are other uh, there was other support aside from the the power plant. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Bob. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, uh, thanks very much to all of our ambassadors for being with us today. Really appreciate it. And I, it has been, as uh, Mr. Barton said, uh, very informational. If I could uh, just ask uh, just a couple of questions, kind of following up with uh, Mr. Terry was just talking about, uh, Dr. Jamal. Uh, on the infrastructure side, since about two thirds of Haiti does not have electricity, and the question is to where the power plants would be in it with the new, uh, with the, uh, uh, the groundbreaking this year and back in August for the new uh, uh, terminal. Do you have the infrastructure, or what are you looking at type of infrastructure you're going to have to have to get like electric generation across the country? And then kind of the next question would be is what type of manufacturing you say that you'd like to see down the road as, you know, you get more power into the country? What kind of... Uh, uh, manufacturing you'd like to see being done in Haiti then? Uh, in response to the first question, this is the, uh, the, the direction we're going in is to move away from a state-owned monopoly in production of electricity and, uh, and it, more, work with more um, partnerships and, and investment through a, with private investment. And therefore, that means that th these are creating opportunities for investors, these are creating opportunities for more job creation and economic growth in Haiti. Uh, and we're talking about infrastructure in the grid as well as infrastructure in terms of, of, uh, of uh, power generation. Now, as this, more of this will come online, uh, we are, for, for one thing, we're, we're making a big effort to develop tourism. 
we are an island in the Caribbean with some of the same advantages or more than uh, other s smaller islands in the Caribbean. Therefore, there, there is a huge potential for tourism that is not exploited because of, of, of the limited capacity that we have. Uh, so that's w one point. Uh, the, another uh, thing is uh, through the, the HOPE Act, there, is, uh, there are significant advantages that the U.S. has afforded Haiti in terms of, uh, of production of, uh, for example, in textiles and export to, uh, to the United States. Therefore, that's another opportunity that we would like to, to develop. And thirdly, the, uh, we are making a, a very big effort in terms of agricultural development. And this will allow us to start uh, to increase the capacity that we had in, in, uh, uh, in uh, coffee production and cocoa production. And we have the, some of the best coffee and cocoa in the world, but we're producing it in very small quantities. Therefore, we're not, we're not taking advantage of the, uh, of the potential uh, that, we, that we could have in terms of, uh, of uh, commercial export. So those are the things that, uh, that we are looking at at, uh, at present in the, uh, in the development of our, of our infrastructure. Thank you, and uh, uh, Mr. Barton, I want to thank you. Uh, Mr. Barton was one of those uh, leaders and helped get this together, and I, we appreciate that very much. And thank all of you for taking time to be here, and I hope that as we move forward that you'll feel, feel free to stay in contact with our committee and our committee staff if anything comes up that you believe we could be helpful in. Yes, sir, Mr. Sandu. Mr. Chairman, and on behalf of all our colleagues here, we'd also like to thank you committee members and the staff for this initiative and your leadership on the LNG issue. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, we'll look forward to visiting with you and, and Mr. Olson in Texas at his festival soon. Thank you. <laughs>